Picture this, an evening two months ago in my hometown of Asheville, North Carolina. Families gathering in their living rooms, but some foreboding because Hurricane Helene had just made landfall 450 miles away, but it was heading north and it could bring some rain. Over the next 24 hours, that calm turned to just total chaos. Hurricane-level winds battered the trees in the area, knocked them down, stripped the leaves off of them. 31 inches of rain fell. The rivers rose, started carrying away homes, buildings. We lost 105 lives. One of them was, was Omar Khan. He was, he was our neighborhood pharmacist, known for a gentle touch, calm voice, giving a child a flu shot. The Swannanoa River rose, lifted his duplex off the foundation, swept downstream, swept him away. We circulated missing posters for 11 days. When it hits home like this, it's just different. I mean, and it was a particularly big surprise in Asheville. In Asheville, just recently, we had topped lists where you could go, they said, to flee extreme events like this. What's going on here? What's going on? The scientists said, well, we got 50% more rain in Hurricane Helene due to climate change. How? Well, global warming has been heating the ocean. 90% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases has gone into the oceans. So the Gulf of Mexico over the last century has just gotten warmer and warmer and warmer. Warm oceans makes hurricanes bigger and more powerful. So Helene was able to travel 450 miles on a single tank of gas, twice the width of Katrina, more powerful than Katrina 20 years ago. Whew, that's a lot, everybody. Raise your hand if you have a moment every once in a while like me where it just feels like maybe this climate challenge is too much to handle. Yeah. <clears throat> me too. The good news is we know what needs to be done. We have the technologies, we have the policies we're hearing about here at this, in these talks. The research is out there. The research is out there. But John Sturman here at MIT, my colleague, said it best. Research shows that showing people research doesn't work. Research shows that showing people research, clearly for climate science, doesn't work. How, my friends, are we going to engage people on their own terms, in deep ways, in ways that create different futures. I'd like to show you something really remarkable, an ability to glimpse into the future to see if we change behavior today, how much better things could be. Our team at Climate Interactive with our colleagues here at MIT have developed this global model en roads. Over a million people around the world use it. And that was many more than I expected. Uh, it's being used because, so broadly, not because of the United States, but because it's in 20 languages and is spreading around the world. This is the version that was translated by Tsinghua University into Chinese. You move sliders at the bottom and things change at the top. You can put this policy and that policy and try things, see what kind of solutions, see what happens to energy, emissions, and temperature. That's the basic idea. Free, online, 
Around the world, there are now over 800 people who have gone through an eight-hour training course to take it to their top decision makers, business people, communities, and schools to help us get clear about what we need to do to avoid future Helenes. We used it with 128 members of Congress before the IRA bill passed with our collaborators here at MIT Sloan and the Climate Pathways Project. But because it's in 20 languages and free online, it's been used in Pakistan, Indonesia, Nepal, Tanzania, Argentina, China, Nigeria, and the Netherlands. One time, I had a chance to work with the board of a family foundation that wanted to come up with high leverage strategies to get below two degrees. First they said, well, where are things headed if we don't really do much at all? So, here's a graph of 2000 to 2100. The brown is coal, the red, oil, blue, gas, that expanding green wedge, wind, and solar. And we, then they looked at the overall emissions, the pollution causing climate change, and saw temperature going all the way up to 3.3 degrees and said, we must do better. How do we get to well below two? And they talked a lot about ideas. People in the rooms brainstormed, oh, we need hydrogen storage of electricity, and we need wind and solar. We need to cut methane in agriculture and energy, the clean energy revolution, protect forests, maybe pull some carbon out of the atmosphere. Over 45 minutes, they brainstormed, proposed, and we simulated their ideas. They got the temperature all the way down, not 3.3, but down to 2.4, moving all of these sliders. That's not enough. We need to get below two. Somebody said, well, I heard we're still subsidizing coal, oil, and gas, the primary pollutants in climate change. What if we were able to cut those subsidies back? Watch as we simulate it. Look at the brown area as we reduce the subsidies on coal, the red area as we reduce the subsidies on oil, and the blue as we reduce subsidies on natural gas. Temperature came down a little bit. Someone else in the board room said, well, wait, why are we even investing in coal anymore? We can go and look, what if we stop investing, reducing new coal infrastructure? Watch bottom right, phasing out coal. Someone said, carbon pricing, 2.2 degrees, 1.9, 1.8, we did it. We got below two degrees. Look at the temperature that this group came up with rising past 1.5, which is not good, but balancing out. They were able to create a vision of a future they really wanted. But how are things better? What about with health, with deaths from extreme heat, instead of following that black line, balancing out with the blue line, doing much better with health? But where? Now we've integrated maps from probable futures, so we can go see where. Are we seeing these benefits anywhere in the world? Go look here in the Boston area. And address equity along the way. Can we have environmental justice, reductions in air pollution? Look at that blue line and how steeply it falls. This is creating more equity around the world. And for me, particularly dear, is seeing how many fewer people would deal with hurricanes and tropical cyclones, not following that dotted line, but following this pink line. Fewer people going through what I went through and my people in Asheville with Helene. That board of directors of that family foundation experienced a scenario that they had created and got a sense of how much better it would be, what is high leverage, what is low leverage. They proposed a new policy, and they had some new investments in the developing world. And not just this foundation. Professor Juliet Rooney Varga here in the, the area at UMass Lowell did a study. She talked to people before and after this simulation experience and found that 40% of the people who went through the simulation were convinced to take new actions 
And of those people, 75% six months later actually did. It works. What works? Real people and real impacts in real lives. Acknowledging that new information doesn't change hearts and minds. New experiences change hearts and minds. And it's incredibly powerful when we can help people see through simulation what it could look like out in the future if we really take on these important issues. My friends, the future is not yet written. We can shape it. Take this simulation, take other simulations to your top leaders, to the businesses, to communities, to the schools. You can do it. What we're going to do, we're not just going to let change happen. We're going to be the reason that change happens for the better. Let's all remember Omar Khan. We can avoid so many unneeded tragic deaths like his. Think for a moment, 20 years from now, thinking back to this time and the actions that we take, what if we could create a better world, save millions of lives? That's the future that I want. We can do it, everybody. Let's go get them. Thank you very much. Thank you.